green light that we're broadcasting. Well, it looks like we're streaming now. So go ahead, Mr. Childers. All right. Uh, so I would like to welcome everyone to the September 15th, 2020 regular board meeting of the Central Union High School District. We are reconvening into open session from closed session. Um, at this point, there is no action to report that was taken in closed session, although um, there is action that we need to take in open session as a result of closed session discussion. And so at this time, I would entertain a motion from my fellow board members with respect to closed session item number one, student matters and uh, the potential approval of a recommendation for readmission of case one. Do I have a motion? I'll make the motion to for the student, uh, student one. I'll second that motion. Okay, it's been moved by Trustee Jones, seconded by Trustee Walker. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, please signify saying nay. And if there are any abstentions, please speak now. Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. And so we've approved the recommendation for readmission of case one. So other than that, there's nothing else to report from uh, closed session. So at this time, I would invite uh, our attendees, even though we are uh, interacting uh, via remote uh, connection on Zoom, to join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. And I think the flag will appear here momentarily. All right, ready, begin. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, America and to the republic for which is stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, now we will move on to uh, communications and recognition. So um, I would invite uh, communication from uh, my fellow board members. We'll start with Trustee Garcia Reese. Um, I just want to welcome back everybody and congratulate everyone for trying to work this out. This learning. Um, Everybody, it's a heartache, a headache for everybody, and we just we, we just gotta do it. Thank you for the hard, and thank you for everything together. All right, Trustee Jones. I will echo her comments and say it. it's nice to see people, even though it's by Zoom. Uh, uh, maybe it's my mic. Let me turn it down. Is that better? Yes. It was my mic. I had it up too loud. Uh, anyway, I uh, echo her sentiments, and I'm grateful to see people. I'm grateful we got the committees going. Grateful the kids are having opportunity to learn. They need to be learning. Uh, and I commend those who have been on the task force and the committees to get this done. Thank you. All right, and so if uh, then I would move on to Trustee Jimenez. Yes, uh, I echo those same sentiments. Uh, it appears we've been now 24 days in virtual virtual uh, learning, and my hats off to uh, the superintendent and his staff and the teachers at all three sites and also Phoenix Rising that uh, they're coming up with uh, ideas on how to improve the system. And we've just been informed by the superintendent that they're going to even tweak the system even more. So we're going to see quite a bit of uh, adjustments to our virtual learning. I'm grateful for that. Uh, also, I'd like to uh, uh, just hats off to Mr. Uh, to our Dr. Andrews for, I can't remember whether it's August 19th or the 20th on that awesome uh, IBC press report on report to the community. And I thought that was very, very uh, well written by some reporter. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Andrews, I appreciate you, you informing and keeping keeping our, our community involved as to what we're doing uh, in the district. Thank you. That's it. All right, Trustee Walker. 
Yeah, I just uh, nice to see you all on Zoom. It's uh, nice to have the support and work with uh, so many people in the administration and particularly this board um, in furtherance of educational opportunities for kids. Like the rest of you, it's just been an odd time for us. I'm, I'm trying to figure out why we even celebrated back on New Year's Eve this year for 2020 because the year's been so, so bizarre. But I'm looking forward to normalization, getting kids back on campus and like Emma Jones here in the great Spartan band playing on uh, Friday mornings. Yes, thank you. And so uh, to echo the sentiments of my uh, fellow board members, I'd like to welcome everyone back, um, even under these um, most unique of circumstances. I know that uh, uh, we have, our teachers have worked very hard to improve upon this distance learning model that was thrust upon us in, uh, with very short lead time when the, the um, outbreak came uh, last year. And I know that there have been vast improvements and we are continuing to work to make improvements as we move along. Um, having said that, there is another issue that I would like to address. And um, there was an article in Sunday's paper that indicated that um, there are some youth sports that are, are being allowed to uh, take up and begin some conditioning practice and as a result of that, rightfully so, we've had a, a number of parents uh, reach out to us and I've had a number of parents reach out to myself about uh, where the school district is and whether or not we would be able to uh, begin uh, similar type conditioning practices for our fall athletes. And so um, I think it's important that we get information out to everybody so that we can all understand where we are. Um, I would like to say that um, I would, so certainly support within the context of the county's guidelines, a full um, uh, return with social distancing and with the safety precautions in place to allow our students to become active as soon as possible. Um, having said that, it's my understanding that currently our county is at the uh, assessment level of, of purple, uh, which indicates that there's still a risk of community spread. And as a result, we are under some restrictions. Um, and it's also my understanding that one of the reasons that youth sports has been allowed uh, to return with some conditioning under certain restrictions, namely uh, groups of no more than 14 with no more than two adults and no use of equipment, is because there are guidelines out there that indicate that um, students under 14 can participate in youth sports, uh, but because of uh, evidence related to spread um, among younger versus older um, young people, uh, 14 and older, that uh, there's, a, there's a restriction on students 14 and older. Uh, and also, I'd like to remind folks that uh, our fall sports have not been canceled but they, by CF, CIF, but they've been moved rather uh, to be combined with a winter season. And so that places some restriction on um, our ability to have school sanctioned practices. Uh, nonetheless, though, there is the ability uh, potentially for our uh, student athletes to participate at a club level um, and do some conditioning outside of school sanctioned events. And so um, again, you know, this is, this is my understanding, but I, I believe Dr. Andrus is in a better position uh, to address this subject uh, to the public so that we can all make sure we're on the same page. Uh, but again, to make clear, I think I speak for the entire school board um, and, and members feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but that we certainly uh, want to do anything and everything we can to safely return our students to some degree of normalcy and physical activity, certainly with respect to our sports, as soon as county guidelines uh, uh, make us uh, uh, make it so that it's safe to do so. But Dr. Andrus, could you illuminate on that for, for our public so that uh, we might have a better collective understanding of where we are with the return to sports, potentially also addressing uh, the potential use of club sports um, outside of necessarily school sanctioned events, but um, their ability to utilize that even at the, the high school level. Sure. Um, thank you for this opportunity to add a little comment to, to some concern based on the, on the paper that, and the story that was run. Uh, nearby in Yuma, they're having their fall sports. And in San Diego, they are in a, a phase uh, that's called, it's the red phase in California. We're purple. Um, they don't have the widespread uh, and so they have a little more ability to have athletic type activities and events. However, and we're in purple, which is the most restrictive phase. 
um, the guidelines that are given to us is that it's the only people who are allowed to do individual conditioning without any equipment and wearing face masks in groups no larger than 14 um, is children ages 8 to 14 years old. So this excludes high school age students from doing any of these activities. Um, and so the, the other part of that too is that we participate in the California Interscholastic Federation or CIF. Um, and right now the traditional fall season has been merged into the winter and winter has been merged into spring. So there is no fall season at all. And so right now, any high school in the CIF that's participating in sports would be doing it illegally. So right now we are out of season and no athletic, no organized high school act activities or practices can take place at this point in time. Now, uh, Mr. Childers mentioned um, club sports. Clubs operate separately from schools. Those are like select soccer, or AAU basketball, or Little League. All of those are community nonprofit organizations that operate. And they are free to do so because they don't, they don't, well, they're, they don't fund, fall under our jurisdiction and they can do that. Any member of the community can participate in those types of activities. Um, and they're at your own expense and your own risk and those types of things. Some of those organizations have started trying to do some activities and workouts, even for people um, of older ages, high school age students. In our county, we're, that isn't permissible. And so we have chosen to, um, and all the districts, the county superintendents in coordination with our county health official have agreed that uh, it's not even best practice to allow our facilities to be used by club organizations because we're not allowed to bring our students on campus. So the school districts would should not um, allow, you know, their facilities to be used by club organizations. So as a collective school districts in the county, we've determined that it's just not safe and we don't have authorization to proceed. So we're still in a bit of a holding pattern. Now, individuals on their own can go jogging. Uh, Mr. Jimenez tells me his park across um, in his neighborhood looks pretty active with people out there running and doing what they want to do. And there aren't any adults. So it's just students getting together, children, you know, young people doing this on their own. And so we do encourage, and I go out on a walk, I walk around and try and get some exercise. So individuals are probably a, are very permissible to do your own, but we can't have any organized um, activities, nor is the district facilities available for organized events by clubs. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Just, you know, speaking for myself, you know, I want to make clear for the record that um, as soon as county guidelines allow, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to, um, safely reopen our facilities and make it available for people to um, safely engage in physical activity. Um, and I know that, you know, we're always watching county guidelines. So again, appreciate um, all of the parents who have expressed their concern as a parent myself, although not of high school students, I understand uh, very well the need for our kids to get physical activity and, and some engagement. Um, it, it, this has been a difficult time. So uh, it, it's something that we need to pay close attention to. I'd also like to make one other comment. I noticed, you know, we're still learning this technology. I noticed that Ms. Mrs. Sikon had a hand raised. I'm not sure how to, how to allow her to comment. I think what's next on our agenda uh, for Mrs. Sikon's benefit is our student board comments. And then we have our public comment session. So if we can move Mrs. Sikon into the, um, the queue for making a public comment uh, uh, to our tech folks, I would appreciate that because it appears based on, at least I'm interpreting the hand raised that way is that she wants to make a comment. So if we could make, uh, make that available to her. And then in the meantime, we'll move on to comments from our uh, student board member. We'll start with our student board member from Central. Um, uh, is it Jitsiri Soto? Thank you. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes, Ms. Soto, we can hear you. Thank okay. you. Okay. So do I say my report now? Yes, yes. Why don't you uh, introduce yourself? Tell us what year you are in school and, and, uh, and then go ahead and, and give us your report. We're looking forward to it. Okay. So good evening, board members, Superintendent Andres, and community members. My name is Atili Soto and I'm a senior and I'm your board representative from Central Union High School. So Central's ASB has been working to keep in touch with the students, 
keeping them as informed as they can be through social media. We created a welcome back video and have continued with our We Wear Blue campaign, encouraging students to wear blue on Fridays, to stay connected, participate, and feel involved. Our Commissioners of Community Service organized the Community Awareness Spirit Week, um, and we ran an activity with a Start With Hello video in, our, in conjunction with the Sandy Hook Promise campaign. Our Commissioners of Athletics have worked with our new ID to make an athletics Instagram page to keep athletes informed with important dates and information. Many athletes are being highlighted for their accomplishments during their four years at Central. Now that they're going to universities and many, many have accepted scholarships. We try to keep school spirit as much as possible with Friday activities, prizes, and shout outs. And our future events include a virtual club fair so that the students can know what each club has to offer and if they would be interested. Class elections, which we're still planning with this new online system. Higher Ed Spirit Week from September 1st to the 25th. And 9 to 11 grade ID picture schedule for October 5th to 6th. I thank you for your time tonight and remind everyone to go for Central Studies B on our social media accounts at CUHS underscore updates on Instagram and Twitter. Thank you very much, Ms. Soto. And now we will move on to our um, Southwest Student Board Report from Ani Ariza. Hello, good evening. Is the audio okay? Uh, you're breaking up just a little bit, um, but I would say, you know, go ahead and, and try. And if we, we have difficulty, we'll, we'll let you know, okay? Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, first and foremost, I want to say um, what an honor it is to be to be elected as the school board representative under the direction of Mr. Spanos and our principal, Mr. Phillips. So in this short period of time that we have been at um, school, our Southwest ASB has organized a Vacation Spirit Week where we encourage students to participate in our at home Spirit Week complete with a lunchtime activity. The Spirit Days were Space Out Monday, Beach Bash Tuesday, Walt Disney Wednesday, Into the Wild Thursday, and Purple and Gold Friday. We have been also um, making an effort to recognize staff during this quarantine. Our staff that we recognized this week was Lourdes Reese, and we have um, plans and motions to upstart our link crew and make a possible freshman orientation, as well as planning a club brunch. Our SHS HOSA has been particularly active during this time. They have created a new initiative called SHS SOAR. Um, this is encouraging students to reach new heights during distance, distance learning. They have been posting positive things that can be done to uplift students during this difficult time in the bulletin. The, they have also coordinated a HOSA Mental Health and Suicide Prevention Week, which took place last week. This consisted of a series of webinars during both lunches that give messages of positivity and self-analyzation for students. A special guest was hosted for each webinar. HOSA is also branching out their mental health initiative to Palmdale High School. IBROP, in coordination with SCTE, um, has created a virtual calming room for students with multiple resources such as breathing exercises and helpful videos. They have also set up conference dates for parents to navigate the new online school. And that's it for my report. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. And now we will move on to our returning Desert Oasis High School student board member, Jude Montagna. Jude, are you there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, so, my name is Jude Montagna. Excuse me, is it too loud? No, you're perfect. Okay, thank you. It's because I had some feedback. I'm sorry for that. Uh, well, my name is Jude Montagna. I am a Desert Oasis Panther. I am in 12th grade and I am student representative for the school. So at Desert Oasis, it's a, 
nice small well it's not small it's a nice school right now for this whole covid online is real not i wouldn't say easy because it's still something to get used to and me i just i need a classroom environment to learn but i love that contacting teachers is way easy there's really no problems i could email them at any time remind app is useful plus google classroom any missing assignments to get done, I could get it done as soon as they assign it, so I won't have to be longer in front of a computer screen. Other than um, that, the school, I would say, is doing well. As uh, students, we keep in contact, and, well, I know I do. I have a lot of good uh, group chats with classes I'm in, so if we have any problem, we could just text each other there with the assignment. Mm, Desert Oasis. Right now we are looking to start an ASB. We need to start sending applications and looking for kids, but not very, not very much kids at Desert Oasis are participant. That's the one issue we have. And I would believe that's all. And is the background noise okay? Yes, we heard you fine. Thank you, Jude. Thank you. All right, and then um, our last item before public comment, we will move on to the superintendent's report, Dr. Andrews. Uh, thank you for the time to, to uh, set aside for a quick report. Um, since our last board meeting, which was August 4th, right before the start of school, we have gone through uh, many weeks and challenges as, uh, as, as we started the school year. We, at the time of our last board meeting, um, we actually had discovered the need to add two um, special education teachers to our staff. So we're hiring new teachers and creating classes to better support and fully support our special education students. At the time of our last board meeting, we were distributing Chromebooks and working on schedules and trying to figure out how do we do textbooks and do all of it safely. Um, and so that was what we were doing at our, during this time of our last board meeting. So since then, quite a bit has, has been accomplished. Um, we are the first district in the county to open and we opened up in a model the way that we thought would work best for our students. Um, along the way, the state of California developed uh, partway into the school year, about 10 days into the school year, the state of California provided all districts in California with a new report that teachers are required to keep on every student every day on how they are engaging with schools. Not just are they attending school, but how are they engaging? Is it online? Is it offline? You know, meaning the synchronous versus asynchronous. So we've had a lot of growing pains and our teachers doing an exceptional job, doing their very best, we think, to reach out to students and come make contact with them and to provide meaningful lessons and activities. However, it's not perfect and there's lots of things that we're learning. We also recognize that students are learning and families are learning. And so uh, we, as Mr. Jimenez mentioned, um, there was a newspaper article back in, in earlier this month where I did ask for patience. We ask people to be patient as we go through this learning process, both our students and community members. The state of California also requires, and you'll see it later in today's meeting, um, that we provide a learning continuity and attendance plan. That's linked in the agenda items. We'll have a presentation and a hearing on that a little bit later in the meeting. But that has all been prepared and worked on. Along the way, after the first 24 days of school, we're halfway through the first quarter. So we're already at a progress grade for first quarter grades. And so progress grades for the first quarter will be due out soon. And the only ones that come out are students who are receiving a D or an F in one of their classes. We're concerned with the number of students who receive those Ds and Fs and the numbers of those grades. So what we've determined is that for some students, distance learning is working fine. But for students that struggle, it's, it's even harder. Like it's a real struggle, like, like times 10. And so we're seeing a few more D and F grades by the same number of students. And so the struggling students continue to struggle. So distance learning has been very challenging. And so we're actually working on a revision of our daily and weekly schedules. Um, a whole group of our uh, teachers, counselors, administrators have been discussing this, these concerns that we're experiencing from students and they, uh, in recent weeks. And these concerns range from the amount of time they spend online, um, the number of times teachers don't have video calls and they just have like an assignment to do and there's no interaction um, and, or there's very, very little interaction. Um, we're seeing inconsistencies that way. We're also seeing that there aren't structured times uh, in a school week where students can get tutoring help. Um, and teachers are actually working the entire contract time, so there isn't time for them to do that after hours either. 
And so we found that we need to make some adjustments in our daily and weekly schedules. So uh, tomorrow, the intent is to publish um, some updates uh, to all of our teachers and to our community through the um, ARIES communication tool via email. There'll be information on our website and also linked through our social media accounts. And all that information will become available about those adjustments. In short, those adjustments will be Monday through Friday, where we'll move to 40 minute class periods. So the, the morning well, classes won't be an hour long, they'll be just be 40 minutes long. And the afternoons on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday will be dedicated time set aside for interventions such as outreach or support or follow-up classes and they're structured. So one day at one o'clock it's for English classes and another time it's for social studies classes. And that'll be in the schedules posted by the schools. So we recognize too that the daily live interactions are essential for students to create connections and teachers to build support. So part of the, the, uh, the change is that we'll require all teachers to host a 20 minute video uh, Google Meet class where they check in with students and provide instruction. And that's every day, every class. Now, some of those meetings will last uh, longer than 20 minutes. So they'll go to a full 40 minutes. Sometimes those lessons are short. It's just, we're checking in today. You already have a project we talked about, but the call is open. Like the line is still open for questions and the teacher is still available. But this way we have a better and more routine, consistent approach to when teachers are available. And it's all happening in those 40 minute periods. This does provide some flexibility of time in the afternoons and on Fridays, teachers are able to complete the increased documents that they have to do, including grades and the weekly report that the state is requiring by our, for our auditors. So there is a need to make some adjustments, but they weren't made hastily and there is quite a bit of thinking that went into it and how can we best find a reasonable solution moving forward for all of our people, everyone involved, teachers, families, parents, and our, and our students as well. Um, we anticipate that during the course of the year, there may be adjustments in the future. But as long as we're in distance learning, we think this is the appropriate way to go. It's our best step forward to make some adjustments. And we hope the best that we can see a reduction in the number of Ds and Fs by the time we get to first quarter as students figure out the system and get caught up and get assignments completed and, and we work through how to do this. Um, there's two other updates I'd like to share and this is in the area of communications. Um, at our last board meeting, it was recommended that we host and we decided to host some community parent so community meetings around our distance learning plan that's being presented tonight. So back in August, um, the 18th and 25th, we hosted uh, meetings twice a day in the morning and evening in English and in Spanish around our plans, our reopening plans. And those plans have been shared before in these board meetings. And all of these links can be found on our district webpage. So we've done that. Um, along the lines to help increase communication is we also now, I produce a weekly CUHSD news video. And it's very short, it's about two, two to three minutes long. Um, it's currently, I'm looking at it on our webpage in the bottom under here on my screen, I can see that it's there on our webpage. And there's a short two minute video all about Central Union's STEM building. Um, this week, you can bet that the video will all be about the adjustments in the schedule. But those other archived videos um, about our weekly news is also found on our district YouTube channel. Future stories, and we've done stories about child nutrition and remote drop-off locations for meals. Um, we've done one about our IT department. In the future, we'll do ones about the Southwest High School Library. We'll do ones about Cafe 56, our CTE programs, and distance learning. As a matter of fact, a few of our students, I'll be interviewing you in your homes, um, if you're willing, to uh, share like what is distance learning like from a home? Like what does that look like for you? And so we're going to share that information with our community. Um, we have updated, we are planning on updating the actual template of our district webpage. There'll be a change in its appearance and the information should be more readily available with some new features. And then also, as always, our district COVID-19 recovery plan page has been updated. It has a copy of the learning continuity and attendance plan, as well as links to, as we mentioned before, athletics. Um, the guidance provided by the state of California is located on that COVID-19 recovery plan page under the area of athletics. That was a lot, but it's a lot of it's about communication and making some adjustments as we're reaching that first progress grade mark and, and how we can uh, find a best way forward to serve the needs of our students in our community. So those conclude my comments. Thank you, President Childers. All right, thank you, Dr. Andrus. And now we will move on to the uh, public comment session of our board meeting. And um, let me just double check if we've had any updates here. Excuse me a moment.
All right, thank you. And so it looks like uh, we have three people uh, that want to make a comment. So we will uh, start with Maria Pinedo. Ah. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, so my comment is related to the learning continuity and attendance plan. I'm not sure if that's something that I should mention here or I should wait. So I'll just go ahead and share. So I just want to congratulate the staff that worked on the plan because it was very thorough. Um, I, um, some of the feedback that I have is to maybe consider integrating um, more of the online and virtual activities that 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 you're having on campus. Um, I thought it was very informative what the student representatives shared about all the activities that they're doing. So for me, um, as a community community member and um, having a, a niece in the district, I think it would have been very informative to see kind of how those activities are being integrated into this overall plan. I think that's something that maybe um, should be integrated into it and, and somehow looped into it. Um, I'm thinking maybe also um, having activities that are culturally inclusive. For example, this week we're celebrating Mexican Independence Day and having virtual events or activities that are culturally inclusive for our um, for our students, I think that would be uh, a, a very nice um, change and and uh, and having a culture of incl inclusivity for the district. Um, the second point I want to make is to to keep an eye on the cyber bully, bullying. Um, I know we were having issues um, even before the pandemic. There was a lot of event. There were a few events happening uh, related to to cyber bully, bullying, and I think um, that may have been increasing. So I want to make sure that that is front and center as well, and we don't um, lose track of that. Um, one of the recommendations that I have, and I don't know how feasible this would be, is to have maybe a webinar or a training that all students need to do at the beginning of the year um, to uh, educate them about how to prevent cyberbullying. I think that's something that's very necessary, and um, our students are spending a lot of time online now, and and there's more opportunity for that to happen. So I'm thinking maybe integrating some way of preventing cyberbullying within our district would um, be very beneficial for our students and for our families. So just something to keep in mind as we move forward um, in, in this whole online culture that we have. Thank you very much. That's all I have. All right, thank you very much. And uh, those comments will be noted and uh... Uh, thank you for those suggestions. So at this time, we will uh, move on to Jackie Valadez. Mrs. Valadez, are you there? Good evening. Hi. Oh, good. Hey, good evening, right. board members, superintendent Andres, colleagues, and community members. My name is Jackie Valadez, resident of Brawley. I am a career technical education health science teacher at Southwest High School and advisor for SHS HOSA Future Health Professionals. For the past three years, Southwest High School HOSA Future Health Professionals has been engaged in the California HOSA Prevention and Early Intervention Mental Health Project. This project focuses on empowering HOSA members to lead activities to increase awareness of mental health in their respective communities. September is designated as National Suicide Prevention Month. All month, mental health advocates, prevention organizations, survivors, allies, and community members unite to promote suicide prevention awareness. As mentioned by our ASB representative, last week during both lunches, Southwest High School HOSA Future Health Professionals led Soaring Above Stigma daily webinars to promote mental health awareness to students, staff, families, and community members. This student-led event focused on the Each Mind Matters Suicide Prevention Month theme of hope, resilience, and recovery. Despite the challenges of distance learning and technology, community health worker students 
created daily messages focused on each theme for the day. Each daily theme featured a community partner who led their expertise in the following activities. Tuesday was a message of hope and resilience from Dr. Alfredo Martinez, an alumnus of Southwest High School HOSA. Wednesday was a mindful body scan activity led by our Southwest High School counselor on special assignment, Ms. Alyssa Campos. Thursday was Know the Signs by Imperial County Behavioral Health Services Community Outreach Worker, Mr. Jose Signs. And Friday was a virtual tour of the IVROP virtual calming room led by Ms. Linda Lopez. We are very thankful for the support of staff and community members who assist students in delivering their message. We are fully aware that the pandemic has led to an increase in mental health challenges, which are very evident among our youth. The Southwest High School Project Soaring Above Stigma will continue to support efforts in our district to support the social and emotional well being of our staff, our students, and our families. By empowering our students to be mental health advocates, they can help to lead the necessary conversation that mental health is just as important as physical health. Thank you for your time tonight and remember that mental health matters. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Valdez, and thank you for your advocacy on this issue. As always, um, you're doing wonderful work with our students and we appreciate it. And this is important, I think now more than ever. So thank you. Um, and with that, we will uh, move on to Mrs. Sikon, Karen Sikon. Good evening, uh, Karen Sikon from Southwest High School CTE. I just wanted to express my thanks um, to our, our um, administration, to the district, to the board for listening to us teachers. We are the biggest advocates for our students and um, listening to us and understanding the needs that we need to better serve them. Um, we so, so much appreciate it and um, that's basically all I wanted to say. Thank you so much. Uh, for working with us and um, making this uh, extra time um, happen for uh, all parties involved. So thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Saikon. And as always, we appreciate uh, our teachers' continual advocacy for our students. Thank you. All right. And so um, unless um, someone tells me otherwise, I believe that concludes our public comments. All right. And I just uh, received a message that, there, that those conclude our comments. So thank you. So at this time, I will entertain a motion to approve the agenda. Is there a motion? So moved. And is there a second? I'll second. Okay, it's been moved by Trustee Walker, seconded by Trustee Jones. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. Um, and I would at this time, um, entertain also the preferential vote by our student board reps. Aye. Please signify by saying aye. 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 All right, sounds unanimous from our student board reps as well. Thank you. Now we will move on to the uh, consent agenda. Um, and all items appearing on the consent agenda are routine business matters and will be acted upon by one motion without discussion unless a board member wishes to have an item considered separately. At this time, are there any requests to have any of the consent agenda items considered separately? Okay. None for me. I'm okay with you. Okay, hearing no requests, then at this time I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll, I'll make the motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll second it then. Okay, it's been moved by Trustee Jones, seconded by Trustee Jimenez. Uh, all those in favor, uh, including our, uh, well, let's start with the, the school board members. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Abstentions? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. Now I'll call for the uh, student board members preferential vote. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All right, all those opposed, please signify. Say nay. Any abstentions? Hearing none, 
Uh, the motion also passes unanimously among our student board members. Thank you. All right, now we'll move on to our action and information items, approval of the personnel report. Is there a motion to approve the personnel report? So move. Second. Okay. All right, moved by Trustee Walker, seconded by Trustee Jones, uh, excuse me. <clears throat> and this is, the day. <laughs> this is one uh, where there will not be a, a preferential vote due to its nature uh, related to personnel matters. So uh, school board members in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Abstentions? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. Now we'll move on to uh, item two, adoption of board resolution ending in five, month of September as Hispanic Heritage Month. Is there a I'd motion? I'd like to make a motion to approve September Spanish uh, American History, I'm sorry. Hispanic Heritage Month? That's the one. I'll second. <laughs> All right, then that's second. Uh, Trustee Garcia Ruiz. And um, then I will call for a, a roll call vote because it's a resolution of the board members and then a roll call vote of our student board members. Trustee Garcia, Lee. See. Trustee Jones. Yes. Trustee Childers. Yes. Trustee Jimenez. Seguro que si. Trustee Walker. Claro que si. Thank you. And then our, our student board members. Yes. They need to unmute their mics. I was, oh, sorry. I was waiting for my name to be called. That's okay. Yes, I can do that. Uh, student board member Montaña. Oh, yes. Thank you. Student board member Ariza. Yes. And student board member Soto. Yes. All right. The... Uh, Resolution declaring the month of September as Hispanic Heritage Month passes unanimously on all fronts. All right, now time for the second reading and adoption of the, po the uh, proposed revisions to board policies and administrative regulations. Do I have a motion? I move that we adopt the proposed revisions to board policies and administrative regulations as, pre as presented to the board. All right, is there a I'll second? second. Okay, it's been moved by Trustee Jimenez, seconded by Trustee Jones. Of uh, the school board members, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Abstention. Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously among the school board members. Now I'll call for the student uh, board members' preferential vote. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Abstention. Hearing none, unanimous vote among our student board members as well. All right, now we will um, open a public hearing regarding the learning continuity and attendance plan. Um, Dr. Andrews, is there going to be a, any kind of presentation on this or are we just opening the public hearing? So prior to opening for public hearing as we get to the, the agenda, uh, Ms. Sherry Hart, Superintendent of Education Services, who's been the primary author and the gatherer and the completer of this report. We all chimed in a little bit, but let's face it, Ms. Hart is the one who made sense of all of our comments and put it together. And so we appreciate the effort, uh, the timelines required to do this, along with the other duties. Again, this is a new thing to us this year. She has a brief presentation to tell us uh, an overview of it, not dive into all the details of our plan, but an overview of what's in the Yes, so to clarify, we are not opening the public hearing just yet. We're here a presentation from our um, a very wonderful and qualified assistant superintendent, Mrs. Hart. Yeah, can everyone hear me? Yes. Hear me. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen, I know, because I'm a Google Meeter, not a Zoomer. So let's make, let, let me know if this works once it uh, is up, I hope. Ah! See, it's not going to do it. Why won't it? Okay, Ward, you're going to have to tell me why can I not see my screen to choose from? Oh, no, I can. Forget it. Here we go. Ah, can everybody see that? Yes. Okay, perfect. Let me get it into presentation mode. 
I'm glad I'm not the only one who has technical difficulty with Zoom. So you're making me <laughs> here today. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I would have preferred not to have, but um, nonetheless. So as Dr. Andrews indicated, this really is, um, I, I feel like I'm the chief compiler. Uh, lots of help from lots of different individuals providing information about the services and activities that are taking place. So most of you are aware that this plan is in lieu of an LCAP, but it's not an LCAP. It's not intended to be an LCAP. It has some minor budget sections that I'll point out, um, but it is a description of how districts have responded to uh, COVID-19 and what the impacts on schools have been. So I'm going to, again, as Dr. Andrus indicated, I'm gonna go over the sections um, and kind of provide a brief description of what's included. I'll allude to some of the specifics, but not very much. Um, all of you have had an opportunity to read the plan, so I'm not going to go into all those details. And besides, we'd be here all night if I did. So um, the plan starts off with just some very general information about how we responded initially to the school closures and the pandemic in our area and what our local conditions are. It then moves on to a few pages that have to do with stakeholder engagement. Much like the expectations for LCAP, there were similar expectations for what I call the LCP um, because we folks are confused by the acronym being the same but it not being the same, so we call it the LCP. So the stakeholder engagement um, that we conducted really maintained the fidelity to the intent. Uh, Dr. Andrus, as he indicated, conducted four meetings, two in Spanish, two in English, specifically to solicit input from our community and parents. We also had a district parent advisory committee meeting. We had a district English language advisory committee meeting. Most of you are aware of our think tank that is made up largely of certificated staff members who have been involved in a lot of the discussions about the models of instruction and what our teacher expectations are. We've also conducted a lot of surveys. Um, so a couple of parent surveys, a couple of, uh, well, student surveys, a number of teacher surveys. So we have gotten a lot of input over the last six months about what sort of an activities we are engaged in now um, and in the future in response to uh, the school closures primarily. The, uh, one of the sections specifically asks for uh, us to describe our procedures for actually soliciting participation. Obviously it's all been virtual. Um, then we have to summarize the feedback provided by each of the stakeholder groups. And so those are identified by the various, by students, by parents, by teachers, uh, and administrators. And the last section of the stakeholder engagement uh, portion of the plan is what was the impact. And all of what you're seeing that we have implemented thus far is a result of various stakeholder groups uh, input. So the largest portion of the plan has to do with what's up in the top, the continuity of learning. And it's broken down into a number of sec uh, subsections, starting with seems out of, out of sequence to me, but it starts with our description of in-person instructional offering. So there are about four pages of that that focus on the details of what it will look like when we begin to bring students back. And most of you are aware of the fact that it's gonna start with very, very small specialized groups. We're already assessing some of our English learners in person, because that's really the only effective way to do that. And then the plan is when the conditions allow for us to bring back 25% of the students one day a week, and then 50% of the students two days a week. And when we get there to bringing all of the students back, certainly while keeping all of the safety precautions in mind. And when we do that, uh, there's, there's gonna be a lot of need for student supports, which are described in the plan and all of the safety measures. This is one of those sections that has a small budget with expenditures um, and actions identified that look much like an old LCAP, but on a much more limited basis. 
The next section under continuity of learning has to do with our distance learning program. So we start with a description of what that program looks like and go to, if I don't know, I don't know, um, a description of our access to devices and connectivity. I think that um, everyone is aware that in March when we closed, we quickly began to take apart all of what we call CALS, our computers on wheels, and disseminating those Chromebooks out into the community. And we had requests for about 1,300 devices at that time. Um, and we surveyed the, the parents again to say, what are your needs? And we felt like we were responsive and we, and we were responsive to every student who requested a Chromebook at that time. After the summer, so we, we checked out, like I said, about 1,300 and, and about 100 MiFi devices. After the summer, I think, and after that experience, a lot more students recognize their need to also check out a district device. And to date, we've checked out over 2,400 um, Chromebooks, and we've ordered another, we ordered in the first go round, I think, another 500 and have another order of 500 or 600 underway. Uh, even though we've met all the needs, we're recognizing that some of our Chromebooks are at end of life and some of them are broken and damaged. And so we're going to begin to need to also deploy uh, ones that are more functional. Uh, and I think we've ordered, in addition to we disseminated, I think the plan only says 100, but I think we've already disseminated or distributed uh, another 150 MiFi's and ordered more five, MiFi's as well. Uh, the other part of this section has to do with our measurement of pupil participation and progress. Uh, you've heard us uh, some description about how we changed our attendance procedures and rolled out in response to a state requirement, a weekly engagement report, which really is a daily engagement report. And we also have a, a description of how various teachers uh, are assessing students. It is good to note, I think, that the Department of Education is going to administer the CAS this year. So our 11th graders will be taking CAS uh, regardless of whether we're in a distance learning or an in-person mode. Uh, there also was a, a section where we described the professional development. The vast majority of the professional development that is taking place is being provided by our own instructional coaches but teachers are also, and administrators, I participate in a lot of virtual training that's provided by the County Office of Education, the Department of Education, other county offices, and some private professional development uh, vendors. There's a whole section, and I definitely won't go into all of this, but how all of our staff members' roles and responsibilities have changed. And there's so, so there are some examples in this section of the plan. Distance learning continues about the supports that we're providing for. Sure, let me interrupt real quick. Okay. Have you been advancing your slides? Because we're not seeing them go through the slide deck. <gasps> I know that because I know what's in the plan and I know what you've been talking about, <laughs> but we've seen the same cover slide. So if there's a way, I don't know. It's in my screen sharing and I've been going through them. Well, that's ah. our fault. We're not catching it earlier. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I hope you're all good auditory learners because that would have been more than I had wanted to hear for seven slides. Um, let me let me go out of this. Stop sharing. Let me try again. Well, crud. Okay, I'm gonna go. Out of this and. I'm going to just share it not in presentation mode. Let me try that. Okay, can you see my screen now? No? Yes, I can see it. I was okay. trying to stab on each one of those and I couldn't get them to open. So we see your slide that says, oh, yeah, we got the whole screen now. Okay. Well, that's because I put it into presentation. Uh oh, now, how about now? Yes. That's you can still see it. Well, I'm just going to click on one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So start with general, general information. Then I talked about stakeholder engagement, 
and then in-person offerings, that's all that. Well, and then uh, going on to distance learning, talk about devices, pupil participation and progress, uh, professional development, staff roles and responsibilities. And this is where I was. So my apologies, I, th I must have been when I went to the whole screen presentation. So I am so sorry for that. Um, can you email that to us, Che, just in case we want to go through it slowly? Absolutely. Um, I will. Uh, and I think Dr. Andrus has that. If you just, it's a, it's a Google slide. So we could just send you the link. Thank you. I'll track it down and get it shared right now. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. So um, the last part of the distance learning, the last subsection has to do with the supports that we're providing uh, for students who have unique needs, particularly those who are English learners, special education students, students who are in foster care, and homeless students. And there is a budget section related to that as well. Gosh, I almost got through all of it before. <laughs> um, so one of the primary concerns across the nation and very much so in our own state has to do with this issue of the potential for pupil learning loss. Uh, there is an expectation that uh, due to a number of factors, connectivity being one, high absence rates, and just the challenges for some students participating in online learning, that after the end of last spring and and whatever portion of time we remain in distance learning that we're going to experience some learning loss uh, our hopes would be that that would not occur but the reality is is that it is likely that it will and so in the plan we were to describe what some strategies are to address pupil learning loss and to develop ways to internally, before we get to something like a summative test like the CAS, to assess the effectiveness of the services that we provide. So we have teachers that are doing their quarterly common assessments, but they're using a number of formative tools to regularly, lots of things like Quizlet and quizzes uh, and, just using the, the Google resources to measure student learning as they go along. So again, the goal is that we don't suffer a huge amount of learning loss, but um, the, the state is very concerned about making certain that districts have a way to address it if and when it does occur. Because uh, we certainly don't want to be graduating students who are not prepared or ill prepared for college. There is a section about mental health and social emotional well-being. So the, this description describes description describes how the district is going to monitor and support mental health. We've asked all teachers to engage with students and have the types of conversations that are supportive and help them during these very traumatic times. And as Jackie alluded to, there are activities that are related to SEL and emotional well-being. We've also done professional development, particularly back in August, for our staff along these lines. And uh, the HR office continues to put out opportunities for teachers to participate in uh, webinars that support their mental well-being. This section has to do, and, and this is one of the required uh, it's a requirement of the law that we have a written plan for tiered re-engagement. Uh, and so it's a three-tiered re-engagement plan. The first tier has to do with the ordinary things that we would know that we would normally do around uh, attendance. So just teacher interactions and things that the school would normally do to promote, such as attendance awards and uh, having signage up about going to school. That's a tier one strategy. A tier two strategy 
begins after a student has been absent for three or more consecutive days during a, during a regular week. And at that point in time, teachers are notifying support personnel who begin to do other types of reach, uh, reach out outreach, um, including our community liaisons, our counselors, our psychologists, and certainly our teachers as well are involved in the tier two re-engagement. The tier three re-engagement has to do with kids who are chronically absent. And those are the types of students that we're going to have an SST for, they might be referred to SARB, or, and they might be referred out to other community-based organizations to provide support such as mental health. And um, school nutrition is a section, Mr. Preciado wrote us to this section that has to do with the nutritional services that we're providing out in the community. So we initially started by just providing meals that were available at the school sites. And at the same time, we're, we're going out to remote areas to deliver meals. Uh, and that has evolved over time and will continue to evolve uh, in terms of the locations that where we're offering those, those services. And the last section is very much like an LCAP section that has to do with increased or improved services, particularly for how we are meeting the needs of our foster youth, English learners, and low-income students, and how they were considered first. So there's a whole section addressing all of the specific services that we're offering that address the needs of these students. And that's a quick overview. Uh, again, my apologies for uh, going on and on without y'all seeing the slides. But if there are any questions or comments, I'd be happy to respond. I do. I have a question. Okay. Uh, Jay Jimenez. Uh, and just on, in regards to that re that tiered re-engagement strategy, uh -huh. where there are more days where they're they absent from virtual uh, learning. Again, I, I probably missed. Uh, what are some of the strategies that are being used to uh, re-engage those students? So it's primarily outreach. So um, so we're referring to the community li liaison who might be following up with families. Teachers are also following up, trying to make phone calls and uh, emails and texts or using their remind to, to, to reach out. Counselors are following up with families. Most of it has to do with that communication and, and encouraging parents to bring their kids back into uh, participation in learning. Okay. Then, then the last one is uh, that last, that last uh, slide, it talked about improved by the percent, by the percentage required for English learners, improved by the percentage required. Is, what, is there a percentage that they require that we show how the services for foster use are being increased? So that's the, the very same calculation that we would normally do for LCAP. It's that percentage of increased funding, that S and C dollars. It's, ah, it's twenty five yeah. point some percent. So it's it, it really ties back to those expenditures that we would normally make using that calculation to improve or increase services for those for that population. So we're continuing to do a lot of things that are in LCAP. So services for English learners continue, and services for low income students. We continue to have counselors on special assignment. All of those things that were would have been in a, a, a traditional LCAP, we were well into planning the budget for that prior to the school closures. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Hart. Can we ask questions? Uh, yes, please. Um, you mentioned the, the cap. Um, for the students, like the seniors that didn't get to take it last year, are we going to like require to take that along with the 11 first? So probably the only, and, and I'm just guessing now because there were not a lot of specifics and I hope I heard you fully. Um, it will be primarily the 11th graders, but I, it would also include, there's a science component. And so any senior that didn't take the science 
test would probably take that exam, but I don't believe at this time that they're going to go back and assess current seniors with the English and math sections of the exam. Okay, thank you. I have a question for Arnold. Yes. Arnold, are we going to be participating with the food bank this year on the lunch, uh, lunch weekend lunch uh, uh, backpack lunches for kids? Uh, I have not uh, discussed that or move forward with that particular project at this time. Knowing that, of course, that we are doing a, um, services or providing meals at, a, at various locations with throughout our boundaries. Um, I know that they were providing meals, I believe, at uh, St. Mary's and also uh, at the church in Heber as well uh, on particular days. And so they are also distributing meals to the community. Okay, thank you. Okay, are there any further questions? If not, thank you very much, Mrs. Hart, for the wonderful presentation. And then we will move on to opening our public hearing regarding the learning continuity and public, or, and, excuse me, the learning continuity and attendance plan. And so um, at this time, I will open the public hearing and I will allow staff um, to inform us if we have any requests for um, comment. It does not look like from um, my feet do I'll wait just a moment more if there are no requests for a public hearing comment then we will close the public hearing it does not appear as though there's any requirements uh hold on one second I think I... is that a request for a public hearing a comment for mr duenas He has his hand raised. Okay, can we uh, allow him to make comment, please? Hi, right, good afternoon, uh, board members. Um, Gabino Duenas, uh, president of Central Secondary Teachers Association. I uh, just a quick comment on the tiered, um, the levels of the tiered uh, re-engagement. Um, I was just hoping that we can um, add a level or something in between where um, we don't wait until we've had students out for three days in the week before we um, actively start to uh, try to re-engage them. Um, we, we had discussions in our think tank about possibly getting some CSEA um, staff members um, involved in the process to make additional phone calls because um, Usually by the time that uh, the teacher gets around to making the recommendation, hey, we need to re-engage the student or by the time we get the time to um, call everyone, uh, we sometimes run into the situations where the phone numbers that are in the system are not uh, good phone numbers. And then that just prolongs our, our efforts to uh, re-engage students. So if, it's, if it would be possible, um, let's say that uh, we get CSEA behind and uh, you know, possibly get them to start making some phone calls as well as part of that uh, re-engagement strategy. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Duenas. Um, and uh, Dr. Andrus, is that something that you can discuss with uh, Mr. Duenas to see um, what our options are there? So uh, along those lines, um, Mr. Duenas, by immediate or very soon rapid outreach and contact is very helpful. Um, we had it already where parents were complaining that they see their kids online, but their grades are low and come to find out, yeah, the kid was online on the wrong stuff doing their school because there was no record of them attending classes. And so sometimes communication is happening. So along those lines, specifically on CSU providing assistance, we, our CSU association has agreed to provide support. Um, they're, they're providing support currently in different roles than they've usually done so far. But some of them have said yes, some of their job duties are different now and they're willing to provide some additional support with that calling. The adjustment in the schedule, reducing the number of minutes from 60 minutes down to 40 minutes also provides additional time to teachers in the afternoons where they may also do outreach themselves uh, because again, they won't have classes. They, we're, again, if, when you trim off 20 minutes off every class period, 
from 60 minutes down to 40 minutes, it creates um, 120 minutes in the afternoon that in addition to record keeping or planning or things like that, teachers will also have some additional time freed up that they may also engage in that outreach as well. So it's a combination of both. It really is a matter of, of both um, our teachers, um, administrators, um, and our other support staff like community liaisons to do that outreach. And we really do want to reserve people like community liaisons and administrators for those really, really difficult ones where no one can get through. Um, I did receive information from our counselors today. I met with school counselors today for an hour. I had my uh, quarterly check-in with counselors today, and they shared with me that the phone numbers are much more accurate than they have been in the past. And that has to do with our registration process that we improved this year with much more digital or online registration and also our classified staff, our CSEA members, verifying those numbers and getting them updated sooner. So we've made some improvements in that area uh, to help streamline that. Um, in this case, um, it is an all hands on deck moment, right? Uh, and I actually was, uh, the other thing I did this afternoon is I was interviewed by CSEA state office out of uh, the Bay Area today. They were curious about some of the work we were doing with our CSEA members and um, the, the meals that we're delivering to homes and to individual students where there's extreme need. And, and in that conversation, I shared that our CSEA association has been exemplary. We're not talking about layoffs or reductions. We're talking about how do we get the job done? How can we help? That's been the tone. And so I appreciate President Mora, uh, B. Mora from our chapter of CSEA, who's been willing to um, help our members be available and get phone calls done where needed. We're to the point now where we need to refine our referral system and, the, and increase the frequency of calls home and increase that communications. Um, I, think I think people are realizing like, okay, the school year is a real thing. Distance learning is a real thing. School is really happening. Like there's a schedule happening and I need to be on it. And so um, I think both families and students are, are, are there. So to address that specifically, yes, our association's there and our adjustment in the schedule also provides additional opportunity for teachers to help assist in that process as well. Okay, thank you, Dr. Andrus. Uh, with that, if there's no more comment on the uh, public Ryan, hearing, then we'll Ryan, close. Ryan, can you hear me? Yes, uh -huh. Mr. Jimenez. Uh, just a question for Dr. Andrews. Uh, we have one community liaison. Uh, is he being fully engaged? Uh, or I guess what I'm trying to say is, could we use another one? Does the situation justify maybe having another community liaison to work on those cases that are three and four uh, absences. I'm just wondering if uh... so. So our community liaison is working with students that are about 20 absences. Ooh. So we have a handful of students at, from from all of our schools, which are we haven't found them yet, and we're calling those homes. And this community outreach person is working on those really, really toughest of cases. Along those same lines, I've spoken with our chief of police because uh, our school resource officers, the, the city does not even have enough officers to provide us a, a school resource officer. However, we can contract with them for some additional time to do welfare checks at some of these homes where we knock on the door and there's no answer. We call, we send a letter, there's no answer. And so we're gonna involve our law enforcement partners to help us with a welfare check just to make sure people are okay first, let alone coming to school. In most of these situations where kids aren't attending, there's some sort of problem, meaning like they're a problem with meals, their computer's not working, they don't have internet connection, there's a family matter, or the family is moved. Like there's something has gone uh, amiss. And in some cases, we can help remedy that. If it's a hardware issue like connection with the border link or a computer, we provide that. And we start solving those problems as much as we're able to, that's in our authority and our, and our purview to do, we go after that. Um, some of them truly are family matters, but then we need to know so that we know, okay, are we disenrolling the student? Did they move? And that's occurred as well. We've had students leave the state and leave the county, um, sometimes taking our computers with them and um, sometimes leaving them. And so we, we're finding those things out as we go. But our community, we, to answer your immediate question, Mr. Jimenez, uh, at this point in time, we don't have a, a drastic need for an additional person. Uh, we are looking at more of the, the tier two type things um, where teachers are beginning to see a pattern and they're not getting a hold of the kids. 
uh, the students and we need somebody else making some additional calls. And again, that's where our CSEA staff has been amenable to us providing assistance. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Andrews. If there's no more comment, we will close the public hearing. And it does not appear as though we need to vote um, on this item. It was just here for the public hearing. So, Mr. Chairs, as part of the process, uh, the requirement is that the plan be approved no later than September 30th, but the public hearing has to occur in a separate meeting from the one that it's approved in. So, this public hearing part of the process, the comments provided um, from public comment and other sources or other written comments that are submitted to me will eventually be incorporated into the plan and then brought forward for a final approval in the board meeting. Okay, and uh, which is why we're going to be having a, a another board meeting to approve that. So then, I, I believe I saw another hand raised by uh, Ms. Valadez, and yes, I, I do see that. So if we could um, allow Ms. Valadez to be the final speaker on the public hearing before we close it out and move on to the next item. Thank you, Mr. Childers. I just have two comments. One of the issues that has been continuous is the issue of communication. And we have talked as a think tank and as sites and district uh, about incorporating the Remind app for all teachers and all staff. And I think that would be a worthy investment when you're looking at um, the plan, a lot of it re revolves around communication and using the Remind and investing some funds into that would open communication lines. There is a free version, but sometimes you only get a certain number of classes that you can host as a teacher for free. So if the district chooses to utilize Remind, that would allow additional avenues for communication. And I also want to address the section on the social and emotional well-being. I really want to, the board to know that um, Dr. Andrus really led the initiative to begin the committee, the district social emotional learning committee, and he took charge and said, we are going to do this and make this happen. And since he uh, authorize that to start. Um, sites have been meeting, district members have been meeting, and there's really a push to help students and support students and families during this time. So I'm hopeful that the SEL committee will continue the work throughout the years and that the district will support it even when distance learning is um, no longer needed. Thank you. Yes, thank you for those comments. And so, um, now we will uh, close the public hearing. We'll move on to agenda item number five, adoption of board resolution ending in 06 regarding the GAN appropriation limit for the uh, 1920 school year. And I know that we received a, a report on uh, the calculation itself. I don't know, Dr. Andrews, if um, there's any additional. So. Uh, on this agenda item, there's not a presentation a document provided via email board uh, is in reference to what is the GAN limit and how is it generated. Uh, the next action item, Preciado has a presentation. Okay. A lot of static. I'll, I'll entertain a motion to approve resolution ending 06 regarding the GAN. So moved. I'll second, I'll second yeah. that. It sounded like it was moved by Trustee Walker, seconded by Trustee Jimenez, and thirded by uh, Trustee Jones. Thank you. Um, so I'll call for the question. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 What, isn't that a resolution? Yes, thank you. Yes, it is a roll, roll call. Thank you. Trustee Garcia Lee? Yes. Trustee Jones? Yes. Trustee Childers? Yes. Trustee Jimenez? Yes. Trustee Walker? Yes. School board member Soto? Yes. School board member Montañez? School board member Araza? Yes. Hey, thank you. Sounds like uh... Uh, with with one vote that was not cast, it passes unanimously on both fronts. And um, we will then move on to our action information item, uh, the request for the board to approve the 2019-20 unaudited actuals. 
and the September revised 2021 budget. With that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Preciado. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President Childers, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the Board of Trustees, and uh, folks joining us in the audience. Uh, today's presentation is just that, uh, the 2019-20 unaudited actuals that uh, provides us with unaudited actuals through June 30th, 2020. In addition to that, there's uh, another side of this uh, budget presentation that gives us or provides for us an update on a revised budget for 2021 which includes information based on the enacted budget uh, for the state of California. Uh, can everybody see my screen? I just want to make sure. Yes, I can see. Yes, Very I nice. can. Um, oh, and it's went on to the next slide. Thank you. Um, hey, Arnold. This yes, sir. If you need any help, just ask Sherry. <laughs> oh, that's not nice. <laughs> I, I will do so, Mr. Walker. Thank you. I, I need all the help I can get. I really do. Uh, so today's uh, presentation, we'll, we will talk about the effects of COVID-19 on the California's economy. Uh, we will also have an item on the impact of the state's revenue due to the shift of the income tax deadline from April 15th to July 15th. Uh, we will also have a discussion regarding the rainy day fund at the state level. Um, and also the California's enacted budget, uh, which of course includes some proposals from the governor in which if the state does not receive additional federal assistance, more government, uh, federal government dollars, then there's certainly the potential that the governor or the director of finance will pull the trigger on various cash deferrals for school districts. So having said that, we will talk about cash deferrals COLA, which is at this point in time suspended and it's not funded as part of the enacted budget. Uh, local control funding formula and what that uh, now entails for us uh, at this point in time since there were no budget cuts, but there are cash deferrals being proposed. And so we wanna talk at length about that. Uh, just wanna make sure that everybody's clear that there's certainly the potential that we go back to the 2007, 2008 days where the state uh, with, withholds cash from school districts. Although they don't call it cuts, they withhold cash. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the Federal CARES Act dollars and what that means to the Central Union High School District. And then of course, we'll uh, look at the unaudited actuals for 1920 and the revised budget for 2021. So California's economy, we know that uh, California got hit very hard based on this pandemic. Um, as from March to April, the state lost nearly 2.5 million jobs and we're not out of it yet. As you can see with this unemployment rate chart, the state of California is above the national average where in May we were at 16.3% and the nation was at 13.3%. So we still have ways to go in terms of getting people back into the employment uh, market. And that will help with the uh, state economy and of course the national economy. I will move forward to the next slide. Uh, impact of shifting the tax deadline. I know at, at my uh, July 1 budget presentation, we talked about this shift um, so I wanted to bring this up and, and provide additional information. Uh, I know that California is really like the, the tax deadline was moved from April 15th to July 15th due to the COVID pandemic, but that meant fewer personal state returns uh, for the state of California. And only 120,000 corporate returns were compared to 248,000 reported or, or presented last April. So in addition, the number of refund claims were on par with the prior year, despite being 55% lower in value, meaning less money going out, but the same number of refund claims being uh, funded. I, I do wanna add a caveat here with the latest information from the Department of Finance. And this has to do with re tax receipts based on the 2019 calendar year 
that was a very good year for taxpayers or in capital gains in the state of California. And based on that, tax receipts that came in that came in July were approximately $2.5 billion than anticipated. That is a good sign. But now that we are going uh, through the 2020 uh, calendar year, I'm really going to have a difficult time uh, understanding or if anything, projecting that the state of California is out of the uh, woods uh, at this point in time, so to speak, because the, 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 the impact year was 2020, not 2019. So receipts at this point in time in the state of California were based on 2019. So we'll see what happens uh, uh, come uh, October and December with quarterly returns. The rainy day fund is a budget stabilization account that was set up during the Brown, uh, Governor Brown's era. Uh, at this point in time, there's approximately $16.1 billion in that fund. And Governor Newsom did proclaim on June 25th uh, a state of emergency in order to use half of those $16.1 billion in order to uh, augment, I uh, take that back, in order to hedge off the $54 billion shortfall in the state of California for the upcoming 2021 fiscal year. So this was uh, the triggers that I'm talking about here with Governor Newsom's uh, deferrals on the uh, triggers on the deferrals. So the state budget, the enacted budget authorizes the director of finance to reduce proposed deferrals if there are new federal funds to off offset them. Okay, let me just say that again, that the director of finance does have the authority to reduce the cash deferrals if we receive additional federal resources to offset those deferrals. So it's one has to happen before this, the, the, the federal funding has to happen before uh, the cash deferrals go away to a certain extent. But if, they, if we do receive fed, additional federal funds, uh, the, the uh, director of finance will uh, eliminate the earliest or the first deferral that occurs, which is stated for February 21st. So again, reducing or eliminated deferrals this year in 2021 will provide a tool for the state in 21-22 to do the same thing. So going back to what I just said about the uh, calendar year 2019 and the tax receipts for the state of California. Tax receipts for the state of California for the, based on the 2019 calendar year were very good because 2019 had a, had a we had a great economy, people made money, tax receipts were high, and that's what we're receiving cash on at this point in time. The calendar year for 2020 is not looking so good. I just showed a, a slide on unemployment. There will probably be a, a huge uh, fall or drop in personal income tax, along with corporate taxes, uh, that will have an impact in the upcoming calendar year, okay? So this is a, a illustration here showing that if we receive federal funding, $5.76 billion, up to $5.76 billion will go away. This 5.28 is ongoing and based on the current enacted budget. And in a, in a, in a few slides, I'll show what that impact would be to Central Union High School District. So this is the state's deferral. So again, it would begin in February and February's dollars, approximately $1.4 billion will be then distributed in November of 2021. And then if we need to, if the state needs to continue with the deferrals in cash because the state does not have cash or would not have cash, they would continue into March, April, May, and this June is ongoing. So you can see how much money uh, the state is willing at this point in time to move forward into the future as cash deferrals for school districts. 
please stop me anytime if you, if you have any questions. Uh, slide number seven. This is another illustration of what that would mean to the Central Union High School District. So in February, March, April, May, school districts receive approximately 9% of their state annual apportionment. But because of the deferrals I just showed in the prior slide, this means that 53% of that 9% or a net of 4.23% will be paid out for February. So just to give you a number, we normally receive $3.3 million in February. That will go down to approximately $1.5 million. Yeah, yeah. And in March, the deferrals increase as we move forward through the year. And you can see what the net annual apportionment would be. As opposed to 9%, we would be looking at 1.62% from March through May. And of course, zero in June because all of it is deferred to July. So essentially, we're looking at 64% of our state aid apportionment being paid in 2021. Any questions? Yes. What amount does that uh, involve? What you just stated uh, there. Up, up, upwards of uh, fourteen point five million dollars for Central Union High School District. Oh my goodness. Okay. Thank you. Again, uh, Governor Newsom is hanging his hat on that the federal government will provide additional funds. And as we well know, uh, at this point in time, there are no additional funds. Uh, lots of proposals, nothing agreed to. I hope something does come uh, by way of the federal government. So this is the 1920 LCFF for Central Union High School District. In 1920, we were to receive 49. $2 million, that's state money for all practical purposes under the LCFF. And previously in my July presentation, based on the governor's May revise, the governor had proposed to make up to 10% cut to school districts. Again, for us, that was approximately $4 million and the number that I showed over here in 2021, back in July, was $45 million. So we're looking at $4 million cut. So as opposed to a $4 million cut, the governor and the legislature said, no, we're not going to cut districts by 10%. We're just not going to pay them the cash. And for us, again, it's approximately $14.5 million at this point in time. So although on paper, the budget says $49 million, the state is saying, yeah, that's right. On paper, it's 49, uh, but we're only going to pay you the uh, 35 or a little bit less than $35 million. Okay. Any questions? So moving on, looking at the Federal CARES Act dollars, and, and these were, these federal funds did help, greatly help the Central Union High School District in hedging off some of the expenses regarding the impact of Corona-19. We received elementary and secondary school emergency relief dollars. We received governor's emergency education relief funds, Corona Relief Fund, and State Prop $98. These funds are to help mitigate learning loss, to support student learning in every way that we can, provide integrated services that support teaching and learning, support student and staff with technology, access to student nutrition, and we talked about that through the LCPP earlier with Ms. Hart, Mrs. Hart, 
her personal protective equipment and materials and supplies like disinfectants. So this has helped greatly with to hedge off a lot of the expenses uh, based on the impact of Corona-19. So having said that, these funds are being used also and to a large extent to support current school operations and cover school site payroll. The amounts that we received are down here below. I don't think I need to go through them, but the total amount was $5.3 million from the federal government. Uh, Arnold. Yes. You say that some of those funds are being used to, uh, to supplement our, our payroll. Uh, are we going to have to uh, return those, those dollars to this fund and use for PPE things of that nature once we get our full deferrals? or as we get them, we can return the money to this CARES Act fund? Um, that is an excellent question, Mr. Jimenez. I, I, our focus is to spend these $5.3 million now, because there are deadlines, as you can see here, and spend them now to support salaries and benefits and other operational costs using these federal dollars and preserving whatever cash we have in hand that belong or have been received by the state. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so let me uh, take, let's take a look at the 1920 unaudited actuals and then we'll move into 2021 budget. So here, here we are, I'm just gonna go with the total funds, uh, both unrestricted and restricted. Revenues for this year, 1920, $58.5 million. Expenditures, $55.7 million. With uh, excess of revenues over expenditures of $2.7 million. This is very, very good. And I wanna say that it's because of the last quarter uh, reduction and to some extent the halt of operations that have a great impact to the decrease in our expenditures. Let me say that again. Since we closed school in March, obviously we haven't been operating our buses. We have been decreasing our expenditures in terms of books and supplies and materials other than COVID-19, and then of course, operational uh, costs as well. So there has been a lot of reductions in expenditures uh, in 1920. Did we anticipate this happening? Well, obviously when I presented my budget in, in March, it wasn't, we did not anticipate this, but this is how we closed our books for 1920. So we're looking at a $2.7 million to the good. We have $3.6 million as a transfer out in 1920, 3 million to fund 40 or 400, some call it, uh, for the continued support and cash uh, support for the STEM building and the aquatic center. And the rest of it is for deferred maintenance support and cafeteria support. I take that back, we didn't make a cafeteria uh, um, uh, uh, transferred in 1920 because also cafeteria was in good standing. So we did not make that transfer. So I stand corrected. Going to the 2021 budget year, you can see that $5.5 million in 1920 went up to $63.8 million now. That's because of the federal dollars from eight to 13.7. Federal dollars, the 5.3 that I just showed in the prior slide, that came in in 2021. So that also helped with hedging off expenditures within the general fund. And we are looking at $6.4 million to the good in terms of excess revenues over expenditures. Now, again, this is not cash. This is budget. 
Arnold, can yes. I ask you a question? Yes. Is there a possibility, I'm looking at my screen and it looks like on my Surface Pro, I cannot make your slide any bigger. And unfortunately, my elderly eyes, I can't make them out. Even if you were to use a pointer and follow along on your, um, your, your the digits, I couldn't see them. Is there any way does they, to, uh, to increase the size of them? I can't figure it out. Uh, so I'm gonna have to go to the, the hard copy that you gave me, that you sent out. How's that? that? There it goes, there it goes, that's better. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. You're welcome. So this is the 6.4 that I'm talking about here. Okay. And so currently in 2021, there are no transfers out. Although I anticipate a little bit, when I say a little bit, maybe forty, fifty thousand dollars going to fund 140, which is deferred maintenance to continue support of eight HVAC systems and roofs and so so forth. I want to continue to make some transfers to see uh, or to make sure that our facilities, not to the extent that we have in the past, but to but to a certain extent here, continue to maintain our facilities. Okay, so um, let me go ahead and zoom in. So ending fund cash balance for 1920. We're looking, still looking at close to a million dollars in deficit in 1920 after we make the transfers out, going from 13 million to $12 million in ending fund balance. In 2021, because of the $5.3 million in federal dollars, uh, we are looking at going from 12 to close to 18.4. Remember that I, back in July, I made reductions to the budget in anticipation of cuts. Those are still in here. Um, so I want that, to, I want us to keep that in mind. I also want us to keep in mind that that $5.3 million at this point in time is one time dollars. So if we have the same level of, of expenditures that we had in prior year or current year, this number is going to be impacted. Again, that $5.3 million is one time dollars. Any questions? So at this point in time, I'm looking at uh, unrestricted reserves for 18, I mean, 1920 at 18.87% going to 30%. Again, this is based on federal dollars assisting the general fund in 2021. Any questions? Obviously these numbers are, are much, much better than they were in July but I just I want to continue to caution uh, our board of trustees and the audience that uh, uh, if we do not receive additional federal resources, uh, additional federal support, um, this could quickly have an impact to the district's ending fund balance. So uh, let me make a one comment here, Mr. Preciado, as you finish. Uh, so it's very clear. It, this looks like a staggering amount of available money but we will experience deferrals. We are likely to experience deferrals and we know what yes. that does. And so by preserving as much of cash, by maintaining the budget cuts, by using the uh, COVID relief dollars uh, as, as allowable, it's allowing us to create a little bit of a slush fund because we're going to use it. And so uh, that's why you see these numbers as high as they are. Uh, this is a, a preventative move so we limit the amount of money we have to take and transfer out of other funds or borrow to just maintain our operations. I, I concur. I, I, I lived through it. I was on the board during that time and we need to have uh, flexibility and able, being able to meet our, our uh, payroll and on a day, on a monthly basis and we need to have a to be 
to be very very conscious of that that amount it's going to it's going to dwindle over over the months um, thank you arnold for being on top of it i don't know what kind of trigger sheet you have to keep track of all those but in the months that are coming those transfers are going to be coming fast and heavy and and i pray that uh that that you're you got 2020 vision on on and on all of those uh transfers thank you for your presentation thank you uh i, I just want to make one and thank you mr Hernandez. i just want to make one more comment again uh emphasizing and uh, piggybacking on what uh, dr anders has just stated this 18.4 million dollars here let me go ahead oh sorry um this 18.4 million dollars is if you if you look at it, it it's really like a balance sheet this is what the the district is worth 18.4 million it's part of the balance sheet what's in cash it's what's going to be important at the end of the year because if you don't have cash in your savings account then you don't have cash to pay the cost of operations your numbers might look good but if you don't have the cash, you won't be able to operate. So yeah, we're we're gonna keep a we're gonna keep tabs on that as it comes uh, comes up uh, here, and most most certainly by January with the governor's budget in January, we'll we'll know a little bit more about how the rest of the year will look like. Uh, that concludes my presentation. Unless there's other questions. Uh, like to request that the board approve the unaudited actuals and the September revised budget. I'll right, make a motion to approve the uh, September unaudited actuals and the September revised budget. I second it. Already. All right. So it's been moved and seconded um, by Trustee Jones and Jimenez, respectively. Is there any comment or other questions by board members regarding uh, the presentation? <laughs> No, so thank you, Arnold. Yes, Th thank you, Arnold, very much. Good job. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right, so then I'll call for the question. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously with the school board. For our student board reps, now I'll uh, entertain the preferential vote. All if they're still if they're still here, I applaud them for. Aye. Uh, Hang on so long. Thank you. That's two eyes. Do we have a third eye? All right, then I'll entertain the no's. Abstentions? Hearing none, it sounds like uh, the eyes were unanimous of the votes cast. All right, now we'll move on to informational items. And so um, we will have our ECSTA and CSEA comments. So let's. Um, Apparently my video is frozen. Can you all hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. So then, um, is B present to give the CSEA uh, comments? I don't see her as the attendee, but Mr. Duaneus is still in the attendees. So if why don't see okay. uh, Mora, President Mora? All right. Um, I, I did not see her on the uh, participants list either. If, if B shows up, uh, she can raise her hand and let us know. And uh, then we will move on to Mr. Duenas from the El Centro Secondary Teachers Association. Hi. Um, don't have many comments other than just uh, I wanted to say thank you to the board and thank you to Dr. Andrews for the continuous conversations that we've been having throughout this whole process um, and the commitment to being flexible and, and being able to adjust. It's been uh, very uh, trying, and but it's it's been, uh, I guess, doable. So um, that's all I have for today. Thank you. All right, Mr. Duenas, thank you for those comments. And so uh, with that, I believe we will be convening into reconvening into closed session. And so um, we will report out after we have concluded our closed session. 
So at this time, I would ask my uh, fellow board members to uh, leave the open session meeting and click back into the closed session link. Ryan, can I make a comment before we go? Absolutely. When we had a comment section, say, comments by the board, I forgot to mention that our former athletic director, Sandy Nugent, got a very nice award from the state of California for being uh, her participation in CIF all the years she has been. And it's a really honor to her, but it's also an honor to our district because she's represented us very well. Here, here. That was it, thank you. Yes, yeah, Sandy has been outstanding and it's a well-deserved award. Thank you, Emma, for highlighting that. And unless there's any other comment, we will um, readjourn and close session on the closed session link. Thank you. Thanks. So we leave, right? Do we have to join back too? I don't know. Because they're going back into closed session, but I don't know if there's any matters that we have to like approve. I don't know either. Do Is we... the meeting over? I thought, I think so. I'm not sure. I think, I, I believe so. We're going to come back, so I don't know if we, we have to come back too. They were gonna come back. Yeah, <laughs> but it was. Oh my god! <laughs> this meeting was long. I wanted to practice, and I missed my whole practice. I just stood there. But do we have to come back with them? I honestly, I was. I'm not sure. They what time did they say they come back? They didn't, they didn't see a time. They just said to come back. Yeah. They said right now. Back. All right, um, <clears throat> Excuse me, guys. You, I asked Dr. Andrews. He said you guys are free to go. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Hope you have a wonderful day. You thank too. you. Thank you. Bye. Have a good day, guys. Yeah, you too.
I don't know if staff, if you can hear me. Okay. Staff, can you hear me? I just want to make, oh, it says I'm live on YouTube. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So with that, um, we will um, reconvene into open session. We've concluded our closed session and uh, there's no further action to report out of closed session and the meeting is adjourned. Uh, thank you for all those who have participated.